a good morning whatever time you're watching this we are on good friday and um are we all in lockdown i'm just giving the koi a bit of treat and as you can see my koi yeah, are not shy in eating so this is uh normal cooked mussels uh just hello everybody it's our third week of uh, lockdown so um a lot of you have posted some questions so some of these i will double up because they work together in tandem uh, of uh, how I can answer them okay so first one is uh, one to do with air in a pond um, I tend not to use my bottom drains um, I'm not sure if I'm building a pond again if I would use aerated bottom drains to be honest in Japan they don't uh, in Japan they use standard bottom drains and then they put the air off to the side um, uh, but those ponds, um, even the ponds that they grow on their fish, some breeders who I know, like Ueno, Yuji san, and a few others, they tend to, um, their grow on ponds tend to be indoors because they want more control over it. And it's more the more expensive fish they tend to keep indoors. The mud ponds, uh, they tend to put a uh, different level of fish out there in that way. So for me, the air in a pond must, a koi needs air, obviously. Uh, you got to be careful of super saturation um, which is too much air and which could cause uh, major problems in your fish swim bladder but we're dealing with larger koi here so when i say larger koi 85 cm plus um, so for me it's just air via an air stone around a pond uh, probably a foot down my pond is only um, 1.5 meters deep which is recommended by like mike snade and, and the guys who are in the know uh, as a deepest that it should go I know guys who have deeper ponds and uh, so that's the recommendation so for me it's a gentle air if you've got to run the bottom drains uh, because you're medicating or you get fish waste build up because it's not benched properly or one thing or another I tend to use it very gentle just to flush it out and probably an hour of a day an hour a day if that the problem being is if you run it too much you can research says it can affect larger koi and swim blood and things like that so in that way that's how i tend to do it okay uh the next question is setting up a new pond um for me a new pond is straightforward i always trend tend to run uh drum and backy shower so like with this current system there um it was the same thing less pipe work um hardly any pipe whatsoever the more pipe work and the more bends and all those things can lead to problems so for a new pond i just that's how i run it um i i'm not sure if that's what the question was but i would tend to run a new pond that way fill it up um no treatments no nothing obviously fill it up by via dechlorinator or you could add some sodium thiosylate uh, and that will remove the chlorine in the pond um, fluke treatments over the years I've noticed and I was talking to Stephen Gray about this that a lot of guys seems to have a lot of problems with flukes and I, I, I personally I don't seem to get it um, I've been using the same fluke treatment for nearly 10 years now um, and uh, I tend to uh, which I think probably is to do with my do with my setup of my pond uh, minimalistic pli pipe work uh, also stocking levels are realistic uh, a lot of guys overstock their funds so the medicine is having to work twice as hard and all those things and and I tend to whenever I treat uh, with potassium permanganate or PP as commonly known um, I tend to uh, right after the PP is spent that is gone brown um, within a few hours of that I tend to add a fluke treatment in uh, whether they need it or not. Um, I tend to do it precautionary. Some may not agree with that. For me, it works really well. And I know for a few others as well. I'm racing through this because I'm trying to keep it within a certain time frame. And we'll see how much we get in into the first video. We may have to do this into two sets. Um, koi ponds and KH. Um, KH for me, as uh, if you look on this video, there's a scroll down, there's a bit with Mike Snade and talking about this but for me a cage ideal cage in a pond is about two between one and two um, and uh, I don't in this pond 
Uh, my KH is not ideal. It's probably around four to five. Um, in an ideal world, I'd want it down to one. And I'm looking at correcting this once all this lockdown is go gone. I would probably run a uh, recycle RO system uh, in the pond to get the KH down, which is less waste because I am on a water meter, so I can't um, traditionally run a lot of uh, waste a lot of water because I'll get charged for it. And also, I don't think it's cool wasting water anyways. It's a, not, it's a precious resource. So for me, the recycling um, RO is the best way forward. Um, m most treatments I know of don't have a problem with low KH. I know there's the Colombo products uh, tend to have a problem with it, but I don't use the Colombo products treatment. I use um, potassium permanganate, uh, fluke treatment. Uh, which is not Colombo. I use uh, white spot treatment, which is malachite formalin. I haven't used that in years. I have some, and it's always worth having them because I show my koi, but I haven't need to use that for years in that way. So I hope that makes sense. Now, somebody asked about um, what uh, budget parameters would be needed if buying Nisai from uh, Omosako Koi Farm. I've been to Omasako Koi Farm, and if I can, I'll put drop in a couple of pictures according to how the edit works. Um, but I don't need to anyway, so you can look down and you can see videos of me there. Um, for me, I would not just buy a couple of fish, cheap fish, and cross my fingers and hope for the best. I'd rather buy one good fish than three cheapish fish, and or so so fish, or maybe fish. And it's good to listen to your breeders. Uh, the breeder tend to know directly and he prices them. Uh, the Japanese are not sort of like trying to get your money to sort of rip you off. They want to keep that relationship and in my experience and, and, uh, and yes they can get it wrong. Although they do, everybody wants money. Uh, the ones that I sort of deal with and, and somebody asked about Omosaka. I know those boys pretty well and uh, they're fair guys and um, I would say you always ask the breeder's advice. Um, and they would lead you in the right way and also it's good having a good dealer that you could uh, ask advice as well because uh, to me a dealer is paramount one dealer not 15 I see a lot of people buying fish and, and this was asked their mistakes in the hobby don't buy from multiple dealers up and down the country or other hobbyist ponds unless you have a quarantine system yourself that's a major no-no um, I hardly treat these koi at all probably once a year if that um, sometimes I go the whole year without one treatment in and I think it's because I keep my stocking levels down and when I said the stocking levels is probably I'm looking at one koi for every 250 gallons in that way and um, that's sort of my ratio I work on it's not exact science because it all depends on how much water you could change if you're able to and you're not on a water meter and you're changing I don't know say 20% a day then obviously you can add more um, but on a rational I would say one koi for every ton which is 220 gallons but for me it's 250 out out of koi in that way um, if you wanted to look at how uh, ammonia and pH works there's a website called monkey sankey Sid Mitchell I think his name is been around for years and years um, he has a really good table on that so I wouldn't really gonna give you exact science on that so if you have a chance just google it um, but it will show you base the basics of it is the higher the pH the more effects ammonia have on the koi um, so in a sense RO if you look at Rod's uh, Rod Hassan's video I did again on it's on this channel he talks about this RO is really not in necessarily about soft water and it's about combating ammonia in a pond and in every pond you'll have a certain level of ammonia in that way it will never be a pond with zero ammonia because the fish is constantly producing it so yeah f reflect on rad's video he's excellent on stuff like that um also trickle in and trickle out again like i said before it depends on um how much water you can change for me I could only do a little bit 
because uh, I recycle my water, reuse it, and stuff like that. So, uh, depends on what you could afford. Um, the more, the better. Um, and that's really uh, my thoughts on that. Uh, someone was asking about the koi that's in my pond. I tend to go down to south, down south, sorry, uh, Japan. So, the fish that are in here are generally from the southern breeders, which would be Omasaku, Momontaro. Ueno, Okawa, um, Takigawa, Tanaguchi, uh, Sakai Fish Farm, Sakai Company. Um, I'm looking now to see if I've missed anybody. Uh, so those down south, they are the sort of the breeders that I would sort of um, look into. I'm still going through my mind anyways. But southern breeders I tend to buy from. Um, the northern breeders I've not been to. There's a couple I'd like to visit, so I wouldn't comment on that one. Um, drums. Were drums drop in price? Uh, RDF. Absolutely. There's more people making them. I was one of the first, I think, five in the UK to have a drum. Um, I had one when everybody was anti-drum, believe it or not. There were some dealers and some hobbyists. You know who you are because you, you know yourself. Uh, they really slated people for drums and I remember I got a right hide-in on a website their dealer is no longer in business now um, about ordering a drum and using a drum and uh, stuff like it. it would make the water too sterile and fish needs certain level of waste in the pond and X Y and Z now everybody almost everyone has a drum so yes I think they should they would go down in price and I think we've seen that as well uh, for me, a drum, and Michael Snaden is the guy who, Yumi Koi, who pioneered this for some of you new to the hobby who would not know Mike Snaden, but he is the one who pioneered the drum and the shower with the BHM, Momentaro stuff. I, I would rather use the stainless steel showers, um, Momentaro showers. I wouldn't use the plastic one, personal choice, and I wouldn't use any other media but backy house media, BHM, the genuine stuff. There are others who use other media and they're happy with that. That's good for them, but that's not good for me. Um, I use the genuine stuff. Um, the breeders out there use the genuine stuff because it's available to them, granted. Uh, they don't have to ship it, granted. But um, when you talk to them and see what they have and what they're producing, I'm trying to replicate the water and the filtration that they have and use. So for me, that would be the best thing. Now, the problem, I do see a little slight issue with showers and that is they're very good at gassing off air and uh, stuff from the water, nitrogen I should say, uh, gassing it off. Um, also it's very good at stripping some treatments out, um, although I've never had to add any more treatments but um, to me it's not an issue. Um, I don't have K1, I don't have jab mat and anything else, all I have is a, a drum and showers, that's it. I've got room in there, so I might add, uh, I don't, everybody's adding K1 uh, chambers, um, which is a good thing, I guess, but I like to be a little bit different, so I might add a Jap Martin chamber, just to be different and see how it goes on. Um, also for me, looking at koi in itself, um, choosing koi, you need to get the body shape right, um, it needs to look less feminine. Especially if it's Tosai Nisa, you want to keep it at uh, almost male looking. Now, if you ever buy an Takigawa fish, then their Tosai Nisa tend to all look like male and uh, look skinny and long, and you almost think, like, bah, would that ever even grow? Well, my big Takigawa that's in here, that she's now 88, 87, 88, maybe 90 cm this year, most people wouldn't have bought her as a small fish. Um, but the body shape was spot on. It was skinny with a big head. It looked male. Um, we all knew it was female. And Mike, had, this is a Yumi Koi fish, so Mike had chosen. In fact, nobody had bought it. I was. It stayed at his place to till from Nisai to Sansai, and I bought it at Sansai at I think around 68 or 70 cm. It just turned. Uh, now she's in. I've had her two years, so now she's coming up to 80 to 90 centimeters. So. Body shape is one of those things you need guidance on and you need to watch more of the videos and um, go in. I can't really do diagrams and fill in, film in. Uh, if you look, Mark Gardner has a, um, uh, um, 
a video would call um, Talking Tossai with Mike Snaden. If you Google that on YouTube and have a look at that, there's a lot of um, stuff that he talks about how you choose a koi and koi appreciation. And I rather Mike help you that way because he's been the one who taught me for many years in the hobby, and um, I'm still in connection with Mike. And uh, whatever he says to me, he's the koi god. So that's how I would tend to use him. Um, there's no real price point for show koi um, to me uh, any koi is worth showing because a koi is only as good as what is up against and it's a category in size so to me you don't have to have expensive koi to win at koi shows in fact some of the, the first time I started showing my koi's were all um, budget koi recommended by Mike bought through Mike Snaden but not and they've beat koi that was like five times as much money um, so don't get carried away by buying just expensive koi equally don't just buy cheap koi you need to learn from the koi um, one of the things the breeders would often say to you is uh, you, some people would ask the breeder is this a good koi well yes for the money you're paying it's a good koi you have to compare koi with another koi and body shape and what it would be like in a few years so don't just get carried away with money equally very rare cheap koi would become good um, very rare um, any koi that's say in a small size just because a koi win baby champion doesn't mean it's gonna go one day to win grand jam I do I do have one koi though and again it's a Yumi koi and that was from Okawa sorry the rabbits running around my foot again Matthew the rabbit just running around me um, and that fish won um, let me see it run at one uh, young uh, um, the junior prize and it won adult champion and it won mature champion and it also won uh, mature champion twice and it just came into the season where it was ready for a uh, grand champion um, but Koi Show wasn't on then and I couldn't show it um, but that's a rare thing so but other than that most Koi's once it wins within one like in the smaller sizes when I say small I mean like uh, baby champion very rare they go on to then multiply up the up the ladder to win higher prizes they can do but very very rare um, some of the common mistakes that some um, hobbyists can make is overstocking their pond that's the biggest one I think um, again buying from multiple uh, dealers to me that's a no-no you choose your one dealer and a dealer you can trust uh, there's a lot of dealer who just take your money uh, spin the web of koi and all those things and you've got to find a dealer you can trust and uh, many years ago I came to a point of almost giving up the hobby until I came across Yumi Koi um, Mike Snaden and it's the first time I found a dealer who wasn't trying to just sell me stuff in fact the first couple times I went down there he sort of just talked about the koi he never actually encouraged me to buy anything it was me who had to push push and push to actually buy something from him and then uh, once I started purchasing coins through Mike, I realized that the guy, the man has that level of integrity. He's not just wanting to take your money. He's wanting you to enjoy the hobby as well. And the guys who shop with Mike uh, would tell you that, that he's the hardest guy to pay. Sometimes he ought to even buy his fish because he's not. if he's not sure, he wouldn't try to sell you the coin as well. The other mistakes that is easy to make is to build up on without bottom drains. I know you can get away with it, but in this day and age, getting away with stuff is not a good way. So I'd always put uh, bottom drain in, uh, overfeeding and feeding the wrong time of the year. Um, for me, I have my own regime, and if I could fit it in this video, in one video, I would uh, be able to send it out to you. But uh, if you can get hold of um, Nigel Cardick's book, um, I forgot what it's called now. Um, Nishiki Goi yearbook I wrote in there um, chasing giants chasing elephants um, on my feeding regime and uh, if you can pick up that it's an, it's, uh, an older copy because I only wrote in the first four or five editions I had an article in that every time um, since then I haven't been asked to write in so maybe I don't know uh, other guys have come in there and it's changed direction a little bit um, but it's a great magazine if you could get the early copies in there I talk about my feed-in regime maybe in another video I will go through that in more 
um, discourse in that way. So hopefully that answers some of the questions that you've got. And um, if you have more questions that I missed, uh, comment on the video itself and I could uh, probably do another video to uh, hopefully include those um, that I missed in there as well. Okay, so just for you to see, that's what I'm facing around my foot. Look, there she is. There's Miss Coco. She wants to be picked up and held. See? Coco. Say hello. So, yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but there's Miss Coco there. She wants to be scratched all the time. Anyways, so, if, like I said, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask me and comment. And like I said, share the videos, like, and subscribe. Peace.